Good evening. I'm Athanasios Platias. I teach strategy at the University of Piraeus. And I'm delighted to moderate this panel. Our topic is probably the most important topic of geopolitics and for the future of the planet on this century. The relations between China and the United States. And I'm delighted to moderate a panel with experts that we can touch different elements of the geopolitical and geoeconomic competition. We have with us the ambassador of China to Greece, Mr. Xiao. We have with us uh, Mr. Chang Li, which is the director of the Thornton China Center at the Brookings Institution. We have Professor Su from Tsinghua University, which is the director of the Belt and Road Initiative. We have, again from Tsinghua University, Professor Tang, which is also the chair of the department. We have a well-known writer, columnist and journalist uh, from France, Christine Ocard. And from comments, we have a third vi visitor from China, Professor Hua, who is teaching at the School of Public Administration at Huan University. Uh, so I will start with an event that took place yesterday. Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor of the United States, spoke in your yeah. institution yeah. at Brookings. And he said, the U.S. is not following a decoupling strategy from China, a disengagement, just de-risking and deleveraging and uh, diversification. So, uh, so my first question to the ambassador is, do you agree with that? I mean, the way that I see it is that since the Trump administration, the United States has followed a strategy of uh, partial decoupling, <clears throat> partial disengagement, and technological denial. And uh, this is really at the center of U.S.-China relation. So my question to you is, which is the Chinese response to this American strategy? Okay. <clears throat> Let me start with the term of scene of development. Uh, when a country's GDP reached or even exceeded 60% of that of the U.S., be careful, this country will be regarded by the United States as a threat to its national interests and its supremacy. And this country will become the target of the U.S. economic suppression and containment. This case, this kind of case happened several times before, like the Japanese, like the Japan in the 1980s, and the EU in the end of 1990s when the, when the Euros uh, come into birth. <clears throat> now it's China's turn. <clears throat> 2,500 years ago, uh, a famous Greek philosopher Diogeni said to the Alexander the Great, step aside, do not block my sunlight. Since then, this term becomes a motto for the later philosophers. So uh, regarding to the topic of the US decoupling from China, let me repeat this motto, step aside do not block my sunlight. So in Chinese minds, uh, there is not only the responsibility to maintain a stable China-US relationship, but also the mission to overcome the difficulties and realize Chinese people's despair, uh, aspiration for a better life through the Chinese path 
to modernization. <clears throat> First, China will insist on giving full play to the decided role of the market in resources allocation and make the huge market of 1.4 billion population energetic mm -hmm. and becomes the important source of profits for global investors. It is reported that President uh, Biden might sign an uh, <clears throat> executive order to curb American business investment in key areas of China, including the uh, semiconductor, AI, and the quantum computers, etc. <clears throat> so this indicates that the U.S. is trying to draw a line for the Chinese future development. From the American point of view, China should confine itself to the low value added industries, providing the US with cheap and primary industrial products while staying away from the high tech industries and especially from those sectors which might threaten US uh, supremacy. Is it fair? Americans want to dictate uh, its economic peace terms to China. But how crazy and how astoundingly short-sighted this is. Nobody could uh, bypass the principle of market economy using, ge using geopolitics to suppress the market principles may be effective for a while, but not for long, nor will it uh, last forever. Second, China will adhere to the people-centered philosophy of development. China has lifted 770 million people out of poverty and eliminated the absolute poverty. In the coming 15 years, the number of Chinese middle-income group is expected to increase from 400 million today to 800 million. At the same time, the Chinese central government attached great importance to the common prosperity for all and try its, and will try its best to avoid the bipolarization between the rich and the poor and the social division. So the principle of common prosperity for all will enable China to better deal with the impacts of the U.S. decoupling. Third, China will strive to develop its education and enhance its capacity uh, of independent innovation. There are more than 3,000 university, uni universities in China, and the total numbers of university students uh, in China reached 47 million in the year 2022. It is ex estimated that the number of Chinese engineers exceeded 70 million already. So some people are worrying about uh, China's loss of the demographic divide, whereas we attach more importance to the talent divide. <clears throat> U.S. decoupling aims to confine China to the bottom of the international industrial train and the periphery of the international innovation system. This is impossible. In recent years, China's uh, electric vehicles developed rapidly, so which demonstrates that China could contribute the fight against climate change uh, with its uh, uh, technological innovation. China is an ancient civilization uh, with more than 5,000 years of history. So the talent divided uh, is born to emerge in China. Fourth, China will deepen the international cooperation on the Belt and Road Initiative 
with uh, proactive efforts. So over the past, uh, China believes that only through the development of the world can China has a wider space for its own development. So over the past decade, uh, the BRI has attracted more than 100 countries and 32 international organizations and mobilized or galvanized uh, one trillion uh, US dollars of investment and established, established more than 3,000 international cooperation projects. We will come so, back to the BRI. Yeah. Uh, so let me try to bring some other issues and I will come back on that. Uh, Ambassador, you mentioned the philosopher Diogenes, but if I understand correctly, in Washington they talk about a Greek historian, Thucydides. And uh, Thucydides brought the idea, at least according to Allison, of the Thucydides trap. What is happening when a rising power, China in this case, is trying to overcome the dominant power. And according to this analysis, there is usually instability and war. So my question is, uh, is the United States trying to prevent the rise of China, not only economically, but geopolitically? And uh, what is China's respond to this perception that the United States is trying to slow or even derail its development? How Washington sees the uh, rise of China phenomenon and how it deals with it. Question for me? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you, Ambassador, for giving a very comprehensive view. I, mean, uh, you know, I also was in China three times after you know, uh, the end of lockdown uh, over the past three months. So I can say that uh, what you said is also very much reflect China's uh, economic recovery and the growing confidence uh, in terms of a market economy, international integration, but also um, the technology innovation. So thank you for sharing your insight. Now the question uh, for me uh, about the Thucydides trap, you know, I certainly should be very humble to talk about Thucydides in the very place that um, you know, uh, uh, he was born. And actually, uh, in one of my trips to uh, Greece, I, in essence, I visited uh, uh, the place that he wrote that, uh, uh, that, uh, that book. And uh, certainly, that, uh, when I was a PhD student at Princeton, you know, we read that book you know, very, very carefully. Now, this is still relevant in not only the Graham, uh, Graham Allison you know, wrote the new book about that, the sort of modern era. But this very much reflect American um, you know, foreign policy establishment concern about China. I think the rapid deterioration of US-China relations, I think there's three reasons. One is the uh, United States has never experienced this kind of challenge um, since the end of World War II, which is so comprehensive uh, in various areas, not like the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War. It's largely the military threat. But from US perspective, this is all comprehensive, military, economic, technology, even political. And uh, so that's, uh, they need to address that, uh, 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 the challenge. They certainly think that uh, uh, this is the two major power. Early in the panel, we talked about two superpowers. But the Chinese may also have a similar, though, though China, uh, Chinese government certainly deny that they want to replace the United States as the number one power. But the Chinese also talk about the Lao Da, Lao Er, this is number one, number two. It's, uh, there's some kind of uh, similarity in that regard. So this is num uh, one reason that the US is a little bit scared uh, for China's growing power. Number two, if the United States is in good shape, if our system, um, you know, political, economic, um, you know, uh, uh, um, even culture or foreign policy is in good shape, we're not concerned about a, a, a country with different political system and a different ideology. Because uh, when Dr. Kissinger and Nixon, President Nixon opened China, China's political system is far different than, uh, than now. And the economic system is completely different. You know, now it's very similar in many ways. Actually, it's very interesting to see ambassador now talk about importance of free trade and world market. Well, this tell you a lot about the changes. But the problem is, we Americans are not in good shape. Look at the, the divides of the, the vicious divides of the, the uh, two partisan politics. 
and, uh, um, and also the economic disparity, that the China talk of common prosperity, in my view, is to want to enhance uh, the middle class or middle income group. But the United States, I would say the third reason later on, uh, it's the shrinking of the middle class. Now, the, so the thing is that because we are in trip, so we're even more sensitive about the different uh, you know, political system, different ideology we, as we pursue, and also di uh, different economic model. So that's the second reason. The third reason is that it's, if the first two are structural problem or the perception problem, the third one is more real. It's why China, as Ambassador said, uh, from no middle class, no middle income group, uh, largely you know, in the 1970s. Now, 400 million is already the largest middle class country. Uh, more than the uh, U.S. population. But as the ambassador said, that the number will double in 2035. And actually, I met with uh, uh, Premier Li Chang, new Premier Li Chang, uh, in March. He said in the next few years that the number will increase 100 million more. So just the next few years. So my concern is when China's middle class double, I think we need to pay attention to issues. Now, it sounds like the build road countries can benefit because China's rapid economic rise is related with infrastructure development. But what about global south? And even equally important, what middle class size in the United States, in Western countries, in, including EU? Right. Now, we know that the United States, the middle class actually reduced from 70% in 1970s to now about 50% or even less. So if U.S. middle class not increase, the middle class in the Western countries, including Greece, Germany, and France, and the U.K., not increase, what kind of world we will enter? So but, I think that China needs to be sensitive about that issue as well, hopefully to make the cake bigger. Otherwise, we will face more political challenges in that regard. That you, you brought several interesting issues. <laughs> Let me touch in one. You said that already China's mid class is bigger than the United States, and in about 10 years it will double. But you see, China has flourished in an area of globalization, and now we, globalization is retreating. So I would like to come to Professor Tang uh, to, to ask you can China flourish? Can China achieve? this objective that Dr. Lee said, that uh, yeah. the mid class will double uh, when globalization is, is uh, retreating and you know, the West is adopting a, a de-risking strategy, or to put it differently, mm -hmm. is the dual circulation strategy a sufficient res Chinese response to these issues? Okay, yeah, so I think that depends on how you view globalization. I actually see there are two uh, understandings of uh, globalization. One is uh, more narrow. It's uh, something like uh, on this uh, global uh, free market liberal neoliberalism after 1990s. That definitely is now retreating. But when we look at globalization in the long run, namely when we look at the, uh, yeah, the rise of uh, capitalism, of uh, uh, this uh, industrialization during the last two and three hundred years, we see actually this globalization is just uh, continuing. And uh, China's uh, pursuit, like Ambassador and uh, Dr. Li, they, what they said, China is embracing the uh, market economy, is trying to work with uh, different parts of the world, even beyond the West. This exactly shows the continuation of globalization. And uh, that's also actually my optimism of uh, China and the US. They won't uh, really fall into the trap of uh, two ticketers. <laughs> Because China and the US, they want to stay in the same track. They both want to be the champions of global market. And what they are doing is pretty similar. That's unlike the Sparta, which is really a military state against Athens, which is a sea trade state. And also very different from the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the West Bloc. 
So this is uh, uh, just, uh, I think, a point which we need to really uh, pay attention to. Because I see in Europe, in also in this forum, I often see people project some historical image on today's China, seeing China as an authoritarian, seeing China as a, like just a threat to this, uh, uh, like uh, the market, uh, yeah, some liberal market. But in fact, China and the West has a lot of in common, as well as the global South. They are in the process of modernization. It's just, I think, the, uh, Dr. Li mentioned this uh, decline of middle class in the West. That's a key point. Because previously, actually, especially like in the 1970s to 19, yeah, and also 1990s later, then a lot of these uh, uh, advanced economies, they actually, the gap between advanced economy and the developing countries, they were quite large, while the middle class in the West, they actually prospered. But in after 2000, with the rise of China, India, and these countries, actually the international gap is shrinking, while the internal gap in these advanced economies, they are enlarging. And that caused a lot of political turbulence within these advanced economies, including the Occupy Wall Street, including Trumpism, the rise of Trumpism. And then they actually try to uh, direct uh, this uh, internal conflict to the international conflict. And I think that doesn't make sense. And I believe uh, that uh, actually the West uh, and advanced economies need to just uh, focus on their internal, this uh, income uh, distribution and uh, to adjust uh, their policy and uh, to be prepared to a uh, more benign and uh, productive competition in the international level. Yeah. Prof Professor Su, you are an expert on BRI. Mm -hmm. on, you are directing an institute. Do you see that what China is doing mainly in Eurasia is threatening Europe? Or to put it this way, do you think that because of BRI, China may be losing Europe instead of gaining it? Or, or to put it in a different way, you think that Europe can navigate this geopolitical and geoeconomic competition between these two giants. Okay, so uh, BI is uh, yeah, today is the, this year is the ten years of the BI uh, proposal or initiative. So uh, when the 2013 the Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, proposed the initiative, is try to meet the challenges of the contemporary challenges of global. Uh, challenges. So he said, uh, what's wrong with the world? Yeah, we have three deficits, peace, development, and uh, governance. So this is the Chinese way or Chinese uh, solution to the world problems. So it's why the focus of the, uh, of the BRI is connectivity. We try to emphasize in, in policy, in infrastructure, in trade, in finance, and uh, people to people. Exchange. It is based, it is based on the Chinese uh, experiences in the past. You know, uh, from 1970s, China is very poor. Uh, after 30 years or uh, more than 30 years develop, development, uh, China yeah, <coughs> yeah, uh, uh, is big. It's uh, uh, better. 2010 became the second largest economy. It's a try to uh, to to, <coughs> to to have uh, to these problems based on the. We have two, uh, inter two, uh, two scenes, two situations, one inside, one uh, in domestically, and the other is internationally. Uh, domestically means we have uh, developed, uh, yeah, East is developed very, very fast, but uh, the West is developed uh, less developed. So there is an equality or less development or unbalanced development. So we are trying to solve the unbalanced development domestically. On the other hand, we can see a lot of issues, yeah, global issues, international challenges. So it's very surrounding countries. So we'll try to uh, have a Chinese development with the yeah, neighboring country development. We'll try, try to build a large areas, a large areas uh, try to by using the connectivity. So that's the main purpose yeah, of the BRI. So 10 years so. Uh, those countries participating in the BRI, 
I benefit a lot from this project, and uh, 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 and this indicator, this is the uh, the real uh, the Chinese we, uh, Chinese uh, hopes to have its development with together with the world development. I think that's the the true. So <coughs> uh, since then we have the other initiatives. Yeah, uh, the BRI is the first initiative, and the second we have, we call the uh, global de uh, global development initiative. And the third is the yeah, security uh, initiative, and uh, just uh, a month ago, the third cultural yeah, initiatives. So all these initiatives, I think, is for the one purpose: yeah, for for uh, yeah, uh, for a better world, uh, a peaceful uh, a peaceful world, uh, a clean world, uh, 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 a a culture to culture exchange world. It's the five scenarios of Chinese yeah, yeah, hope in future. So. Uh, the purpose is to try to, uh, for those who are willing to participate, to, to get benefit. So, uh, and the 10 years experience approved its correctness. So, uh, as in terms of China and the EU, I think uh, even we have, even in, uh, European unions, we have a very, uh, we have a very good cooperation on BRI. Although some countries signed MOU and some are not, uh, uh, haven't signed MOU. But uh, we ha uh, for, for those who signed MOU, we have, uh, uh, we have cooperated in the framework of BRI. For the others who, are not, uh, who, who, who haven't uh, signed the MOU, we can work with other, in other areas, like the third party uh, cooperation. And like we, we have signed uh, the, uh, such kind of agreement with France, with Italy, and with, even with Germany. Yeah. And also, there are a lot of successful stories yeah, of the cooperation in third parties. So I think the, <coughs> this is the, uh, a project uh, yeah, for cooperation. And uh, for Greece, you know, uh, this, this is uh, the first time for me to come to Greece. Uh, you know, in the, in the past, uh, in our mind, uh, in Chinese mind of Greece is uh, just ancient civilization. But with the BRI cooperation, and more, and more and more ideas of contemporary Greece come to Chinese mind. For example, we have a very good example of cooperation as a Piraeus yeah, port. Yeah. In the past, if we try to pronounce this word, it's very difficult for China to pronounce this word. But this word, I think, is very, very popular even among the Chinese students. So, and uh, this is a very good example for us to cooperate. We have many other stories like this. Uh, yeah, on the, the framework of BI, I, I, I think this is just a cooperation platform. The, the main purpose is for development, not for Chinese own benefit, but for the uh, benefit to China and also benefit to the world, I think. Thank you. <clears throat> Christine, let me try to bring geopolitics into the discussion again. The war in Ukraine has created a situation that the enemy of the enemy is a friend. And we see China is developing a very strong relation with Russia. I mean, uh, the no limit partnership. And there is a situation that, uh, there is a fear from such geopoliticians that the Eurasia is being united. And uh, this can challenge the so-called oceanic powers. And Europe, historically has aligned with the oceanic power. So how Europe can navigate a situation that uh, uh, the development between these two giants uh, are, are creating a united Eurasia that is challenging Europe, but at the same time, uh, the Europeans have the American pressure to de-risk, diversify, and uh, disengage economically for China. So how can Europe navigate uh, all this complex situation? Well, it's a, you put the question very well. The answer <laughs> is not an easy one. But I, I That's why start, I ask you. <laughs> <laughs> I would start by saying that we, in Europe, we are another giant as well. We're a giant in terms of trade, in terms of economic uh, power, 
uh, industrial power, and indeed our Chinese friends know that very well, because uh, they try to develop, uh, they're more inclined to develop bilateral relations, and as indeed was just mentioned, uh, than consider the EU as a, a partner per se. And I think Madame von der Leyen, the president of the commission, was perfectly right when, uh, before going to Beijing with uh, President Macron, uh, she spelled out, I think it was on March 30th, uh, a European approach to China, uh, saying, of course, uh, we are a global partner of China. Uh, we are perfectly willing and indeed hoping to expand our economic and, and trade relationships with China, as long as China also observes the rule of law and abides by the terms of the contracts that have uh, been uh, multiplied uh, between the EU per se and, and China. When it comes to the war in Ukraine, I think uh, the, the recent uh, telephone conversation uh, between President Xi and President Zelensky is, of course, a moment of hope uh, in the sense that it is always very interesting to see that China always refers to the principles of the UN Charter, that is to say, uh, the absolute respect of borders and the absolute respect of national sovereignty, which are principles which, unfortunately, the Chinese ambassador to Paris uh, seems to have forgotten about uh, a few days ago when he made very strange comments about Crimea in the first place, but also the Baltic states uh, and, why not, uh, the Caucasian republics. That, that being said, I think that the, the confrontation uh, between China and the US on, on the, the global scene uh, is, is viewed in Europe as, as a, a rather unfortunate escalation uh, indeed, the fact that Jake Sullivan, uh, in tune with Janet Yellen a few days ago, uh, uh, seems to have a, a milder tone, uh, is indeed a, a good omen. And uh, I but think do you that believe on that? I mean, it's probably renaming of the old policy. I mean, it's making the old policy sound better to please the Europeans. Well, you know, there's such a French tendency to think that words are more important than acts that I wouldn't dwell into the vocabula vocabulary issue. But, but when it comes to uh, have it, with the US getting into a presidential campaign and the risk of a, a, polit a political escalation within the US uh, between Democrats and Republicans using China as a sort of common uh, argument, uh, I think we in Europe uh, would be uh, more than uh, uh, satisfied or, or indeed hopeful that uh, the, the, the relations uh, get into a, a calmer mode. But of course, as you pointed out very correctly, we in this continent, we are preoccupied with the war in Ukraine and we very much hope that China can exercise its overwhelming influence over a weakened Russia to actually explain to Mr. Putin that he's really playing out of his own game. Professor Hua, let me bring the Global South in the question. I mean, it was mentioned before. The way that I see it, the Global South sits on the sidelines, especially on the war in Ukraine. And China, India, and the United States are competing for influence there. So how, and probably India in cooperation with the United States in order to overcome the Chinese inroads, both at the economic level, at the technological level, with the Global South. So, how do you see this competition developing? 
I don't think it's a competition. I think that developing the global south is a challenge and it's something that we can cooperate on. And China has made a few initiatives to um, develop the global south. For example, we uh, proposed to work with Europe on third party market cooperation, that Chinese companies will join forces with European companies and also other East Asian companies to develop the markets for the global south so that we can achieve win-win-win. But then of course, when China says win-win-win, the West says it's China wins twice, right? So it's a perception problem. Um, but uh, there are a lot of successful cooperation already uh, between China and, for example, Europe in the Global South. And I would like to mention the example of the, um, the bridge that China built in Mozambique. Um, I have a friend who is from Mozambique, and he says when he used to be, he wants to travel to um, the capital of Mozambique, which is Caputo, uh, from Katembe, which is uh, the other side of the bridge. Uh, before the bridge was built, it took him about two, three hours every day. So he rather preferred to find jobs in South Africa than to travel to the capital. But then when the bridge was built, he can travel there within 15 minutes. So that is how much his life has proved. Then he can work in the capital and live with his family uh, on the other side. So this is a good example of cooperation. Um, another one I want to uh, mention is the fight against climate change. China, Europe, and the United States are the biggest emitters of the world. If they get their mind so uh, possessed, I'm sorry to use this word, by geopolitics, they're not going to see the real elephant in the room, which is not China, which is climate change that is going to decide the future of our humanity and also the future of our children, right? Yeah. But you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, I mean, let me touch upon this comment. I mean, uh, what Professor Hua brought into the discussion is common interest. And it suggested that in an era of geoeconomic and geopolitical competition, there are still common interests. And the environment is one of them. Dealing with global health, like pandemics, is another case, I think, Global financial stability uh, is also another case. And preventing accidental escalation uh, is also another common interest. I mean, do you think that the Cold War, the previous one between the United States and the Soviet Union, that was a mix of competition, but also cooperation on some areas, arms control, for example, non-proliferation, or is a model on how to manage today this geopolitical competition that a lot of analysts have been framed as Cold War II, 2.0. Uh, I mean, is the model of the previous Cold War that was balancing competition and cooperation applicable to the current situation between these two giants? <clears throat> I, I don't want to use the words of the new Cold War. <clears throat> uh, let me uh, say something about the CCD trap you mentioned before, uh, before I give my answers. So uh, if I am not wrong, uh, the war between the Athens and the Spartans uh, took place uh, uh, 430 BC, until uh, 403 BC, which lasted uh, for almost 30 years. So uh, what's the final uh, result of this war? Both states collapsed. And after this and war... Persia was the beneficiary. <laughs> <laughs> and after this war, unfortunately, uh, the glorious uh, ancient uh, Greek civilization collapsed, uh, dropped from the the, the top of the uh, mountain of civilization to the valleys. So this is a lesson. So I prefer to use the word Thucydides lessons instead of the Thucydides traps. <clears throat> so this is the first. So uh, uh, I can understand your mention. Uh, if the two giants uh, compete or, or, or rivals each other, how the, how the world could 
could uh, maintain its uh, you know, uh, uh, momentum of development. I have to say it's uh, very difficult. I have to say it's very difficult. That's so, not uh, very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, if you need the, the help or the contribution from China, I think uh, the best thing for us is to uh, give the relevant respects to Chinese civilization, to Chinese civilization. Let's, uh, let me uh, mention the, different, the differences between China and the US in the terms of uh, its value systems. <clears throat> uh, in China, the, we tend to know ourselves by getting to know our friends. Confucius once said, with three people working together, I'm sure to find my teachers among them. However, the Americans are accustomed to knowing themselves by defining their enemies. China believes the political consultation and the peace talks are the best way to reduce geopolitical risks and strengthen peace. Well, the US rallies its allies by creating tensions. China treats morality and values as bottom, as bottom line and use it for self-discipline, while the US weaponize morality and values and use it to punish whoever does not obey. So uh, we cannot image that uh, China, uh, I mean, from the American point of view, on the one hand, uh, we just suppress you economically, technologically, and other, on the other hand, you should coordinate with me to, to lessen my burdens on the important or sensitive topics. So it's very difficult. It, it will be very difficult. You should... But it's I mean, not for the topics Americans, only for Americans. Should... I mean, global, uh, the, the environment mm -hmm. is touching both China and the United States the same. Proliferation mm -hmm. is touching actually China more. Because if uh, we get a problem with proliferation, Japan and Korea would have nuclear weapons next to China. Mm -hmm. So it's in your interest to cooperate uh, uh, with the Americans on shared interest, rather than to say, because we antagonize, we cannot cooperate in area of global interest. I mean, in, during the World War I, they had the wisdom, and that's how we avoided nuclear war, to cooperate. Why you cannot do the same thing now? Yeah. Actually, we are doing the same thing, uh, as you said. Uh, uh, I just want to just say, uh, when we touch upon the sensitive topics, uh, we need the respect and the uh, equal treatment from the United side, from the United States. So actually, China remains committed to its responsibility on a lot of uh, global issues, like the uh, like the uh, climate changes, like the war against terrorism. You can find financial a lot of stability, yes, pandemics. financial stability, pandemics. Yes, you are right. Yeah. Yeah. How the Washington sees the same question? I mean, you think that the Americans see that there is a room, a zone for managed competition despite geoeconomic and geopolitical conflict? Well, it all depends on what kind of uh, world views you have. I don't want to say America is um, a monolithic you know, entity. I think there are a lot of uh, debates going on in the intellectual and foreign policy establishment. Yes, there's some consensus about uh, tough on China because of the, if you're obsessed with competition, that's the direction you will go. But at the same time, that there's some fundamental differences in terms of uh, complete decoupling or selective decoupling or continue to engage with China. I think that the debate is uh, still going on. For uh, Europe, I think that uh, you face uh, uh, two different choices. How you look at the world, whether it's a bipo bipolarity, two blocks based on the ideological differences, and the Ukraine war sounds like move that direction. But on the other hand, um, European countries, 
in tradition, we emphasize multilateralism and a, a multi, multipolar world, talk about global commons as uh, some of the speakers, I think all of you emphasize this aspect. So I think this debate, just a start. I think that uh, that's a choice. But also a choice, we should be obsessed with ideological differences, or we should look at uh, some commonality and also shared economic interests, not just for economic matters, because this will contribute global peace and uh, the, 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 the common cause. So I'm, I'm, I'm aware of time, I want to stop here. Well, because our time is running out, I think despite the harsh realities of geopolitics and geoeconomics, uh, I think there is no way that the two giants can avoid uh, on cooperating on some issues that they have shared interest. And pandemic is touching China and the United States and the rest of the world at the same time. Non-proliferation or proliferation of weapons of mass destruction at the same time. Financial stability and the environment. So there is still hope that despite the competition cooperation, somehow will develop. Thank you very much, all of you, for this discussion.